Hey guys, welcome to Digit.in and today I'm going to talk to you about a very special laptop and that's the Apple M1 MacBook Pro 13 inch. But you can't really talk about the 13 inch model without bringing into question the 16 inch beast and of course the new M1 powered MacBook Air and my favorite the Apple iPad Pro 11 inch. Different form factors, different specifications but all of them made for one singular purpose and that is to make your life and your work a lot easier. So let's figure out which of these machines is the right fit for you and before we get into that make sure to hit the subscribe button on our channel and of course hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any future updates from us. With that out of the way, let's begin. So the specs on the M1 base machine that we are reviewing today, well, this is actually the base variant. So it's powered by the M1 processor with eight cores for the CPU and eight GPU cores. It's got eight gigabytes of memory, which is obviously part of the SOC and 256 gigs of storage. Now, this is the cheapest and the base configuration that's available for the M1 Pro and every subsequent upgrade, whether it's upgrading from eight to 16 gigs of memory or from 256 GB to 512 GB of storage, all of those increments cost 20,000 rupees each. This machine you can buy for 1,22,000 roughly, um, depending on where you're buying it. So, you know, that's essentially the specs on the M1 based machine. We're putting that up against the 16 inch model of the MacBook Pro, which is powered by the Intel Core i9 9880H. It's, in, it's a eight core 16 thread processor. This machine has 16 gigs of memory at uh, one terabyte of ultra fast storage, which is probably like the best thing about it. And of course costs way into the two and a half lakh rupee price range. The MacBook Air that we're looking at today is also the base variant with eight CPU cores and seven GPU cores on the M1 chip. It's got eight gigs of memory and once again, 256 GB of storage. The iPad Air that we've got, of course, is the earlier version. So it's powered by the A12X processor with four gigs of memory. And that is our entire spec based lineup that these are the four machines that we've got and the star of the show today is the M1 powered MacBook Pro 13 inch. So let's talk about that and get right into the performance. So let's talk about the performance of the M1 Mac. And honestly, this is one of those things where I could hit you with numbers, uh, you know, Geekbench 5 numbers, Cinebench numbers, render times, etc, etc. And you will still not believe me. But here's the thing. Before I got the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1 for review, the 16 inch model was my staple daily driver with the iPad Pro sort of switching up every now and then. However, once 13 inch was offered to me for review, it quickly became my daily driver replacing the 16 inch model and even the iPad Pro for simple reason. One, the 13 inch Mac is extremely light and it fits into even the tiniest of bags that I carry. So portability wise, it offered a great option. But the real kicker was the performance. Now, the M1 chip, irrespective of whether you're running it on battery or power, gives you the same results. For example, Geekbench 5, when I ran it on both battery and uh, plugged in, single core results were 1734, with the multi-core results being 7660, which are both, by the way, much higher than what the Intel Core i9 base 16 inch MacBook Pro delivers. Not only that, when I moved over to using this machine for editing photos in Lightroom and even doing a little bit of video editing uh, on my own, it was quite surprising how adept this machine is at handling everything up to 4K video files without any problem. In fact, even 8K raw files coming out of a Canon EOS R5 managed to open fairly well, but of course, playing them back in the timeline was a little problematic, but as long as I was able to switch them down to using proxies, everything worked fine. Interestingly, our standard 4K test project on the Max, right, when rendered using FCP in on the 13-inch MacBook Pro powered by the M1 processor, finished notably faster than what the 16-inch model could do. And that right there is sort of the showcase of the performance of the M1 Mac. By integrating every critical component into the SoC, Apple has managed to squeeze out incredible 
incredible amounts of performance out of this singular chip. Let me just give you a small example. The iPhone has always ruled the performance metrics in the mobile world. Similarly for the iPad, when it came to tablets, the iPad was the best performing tablet. The iPhone's benchmark numbers and performance, real world performance numbers have always been the highest. And that logic translates over to the M1 chip as well. It's competing against the best of the best on the x86 side and what we see is that the M1 tends to outperform the 16 inch model by a large margin. It, well, anything between a small to a large margin on every account, whether it's rendering photos in Lightroom or editing 4K timelines or exporting those files into HEVC format. So honestly, there's been very, very, very little reason for me to look back and go back to the 16 inch model. But there are some reasons and that we'll discuss in the display side of things. While the performance of the M1 Mac is definitely impressive by every metric, the other factor that really will impress you is the battery life. In my usage, since I've had the MacBook Pro with powered by the M1 processor, I've had to charge it maybe once in two days. And that's actually while using the whole thing on battery life and doing simple things like writing articles, researching on the web, playing music, maybe watching a few YouTube videos or two on the side. When I move over to editing, actually, I'm still getting a good solid 10 hours of battery life. And that's with like 10 hours of editing involved in Lightroom. If you were to do video editing, you can also expect similar numbers. With mixed case usage, looking at the screen on time being reported by the Mac's built-in battery app, we're getting anywhere between 14 to 18 hours of use. That's just ridiculously impressive. And honestly, for the most part, during uh, the first two months, in fact, that I had this machine, I would often forget the charger because of how lazy it made me. Like it gave me this confidence that I didn't need to have the charger on me because I could just use it on battery life. Even now, for example, it's almost two in the afternoon. We've been setting up the shoot for a few hours now. The Mac's been on and running and it's still got battery left. Uh, we, take, we started at about 32%, it's at 25% now this crazy good battery life and that's the sort of thing that will give you the assurance that you know this is a machine that's not just powerful but also reliable when you're always on the go next on the list of things to talk about is the keyboard the trackpad and of course the touch bar now a um, couple of things that are very nice about this keyboard is one Apple's gone back to their scissor switches and that's really nice because it's got a nice firm but plush feel to it. The typing experience on this keyboard is genuinely much nicer than what we've come to expect from the butterfly switches. So that's point number one. Secondly, uh, you get a dedicated power button which doubles up as the fingerprint sensor and there's also a dedicated escape key. Both of those things are separate from the touch bar. So there is a physical gap between these keys and the touch bar so as to make sure that you don't accidentally end up pressing anything on the touch bar that you didn't intend to. The trackpad again. So Apple's always led the industry when it came to track the quality of the trackpad and this is no different. So you'll have zero complaints with the trackpad. It's generously sized. It's so beautifully responsive. It's amazing. The touch bar. Now, I've been using Apple for a number of years now. And honestly, it's something that you can definitely get used to. And once you get used to it, you do see its advantages. It is still pretty tiny. It is still limiting. And yes, there are times where you'll accidentally end up hitting something on the touch bar, uh, maybe like the back key, or let's say if you're in a browser and you're typing and you need to hit the two key, you end up accidentally pressing forward. It's happened with me a number of times and it is quite annoying. Uh, but overall, like the touch bar, while it does its job well, it is still something that will be a very, very personal, pref uh, personal preference. I, for one, would have loved to just have simple function keys that we've seen on way older Macs. They're far more useful. Yes, they're limited in their use uh, with respect to what they do, but uh, they at least don't have accidental touch happening and, you know, it's not something that people will dislike so much, to be honest. It's really weird because the touch bar is so useful and can be if you just give it a chance, guys. Be nice. All right. Next up, let's talk about the 
port situation on the MacBook Pro M1. Now, if there was a reason to be sort of dissatisfied with the M1-based MacBook Pro, it would be the ports. Now, this machine features two USB 4 ports on one side, and that's the left. That automatically limits you in terms of where you can plug what. For example, with the 16-inch MacBook Pro, you get four Thunderbolt 3 ports, two on either side, and you can plug your charger into any one of those ports. So if you have your wall socket on the right, right here, left, whatever, doesn't matter. On the M1, that's limiting one. Secondly, you're also limited to the fact that you only have two available ports, which increases your reliance or rather your need to get an external dock because you've got two ports giving you 40 Gbps, giving you the ability to connect up to one 4K display. By using up one full port to do that is sort of a waste because you can drive a, US, you can drive a 4K monitor and also let's say an external drive using these ports if you use the dock. That is one notable limitation of the M1 base Mac. More ports would have definitely been better and that's one area where the 16 inch MacBook Pro really comes in handy. For professional users who do rely on connectivity, who do rely on having more ports to their uh, disposal, the, uh, the 16 inch machine still makes a lot more sense. The other reason to basically walk away from the M1 MacBook Pro would be its display. Now this is a 13 inch model and if you're somebody who generally edits while you're outside or you move around a lot or you need to edit on shoot and need a bigger display, once again the 16 inch model is your best bet. Apple is expected to basically replace all of their current machines with M uh, series based processors. So you will eventually get a 16 inch MacBook Pro with an M. 1x or whatever like the m series of socs in there but till that time happens which is well nobody knows when apple's going to actually announce those machines let alone make them available so till then this is still a better option the performance metric difference is yes notable but you get a bigger display unless you're willing to carry the 13 inch machine around along with well a separate monitor to plug in so the size of the display and the number of ports do make a very compelling case for most, for not most, but many people to consider the 16 inch model over the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1. And that of course is as long as you're not willing to wait. Now I want to talk to you about use cases because these are four different machines geared towards four mostly different kind of people but there's a lot of overlap you could get a 13 incher and sort of have everything covered so this is sort of one of those as of now in this portfolio the device that sort of does everything very well okay but let's go over specific use cases if you're an office going employee whose job mostly revolves around you know typing up reports dealing with data files making presentations etc the MacBook Air is a far better option for you because for the lower price, you want, one, you get to save on money, but if you're okay to stretch your budget, even by spending a lakh 22, you're able to upgrade yourself to either higher memory or higher storage, which is always great to have, or you just save the money, whatever, your choice, right? So for the office going crowd, for people who don't really want to do anything beyond the basics, that's a great machine which will easily last you three years. It's not going anywhere for the next three years. Great battery life too, by the way, but not as good as this one. Now, if you're a content creator, does not matter what kind, whether it's 3D, video, photo, um, art, whatever it may be, the 13 inch MacBook Pro is such a solid option. It is ridiculous. I mean, I ended up replacing my 16 inch machine with this very quickly, it just happened. But between the content creator segment, there is a reason to also consider the 16 inch MacBook Pro. One is its size. If you absolutely know that you need a bigger display, and this is actually mostly for you photographers out there who on set need to show your client the images or a live edit, a bigger display definitely helps. 
or if you're the kind of uh, video editor who has a lot of accessories, maybe you've got a dock, maybe you've got a color grading deck, maybe you've got a soundboard, you may have n number of accessories that will require to be plugged directly into the Mac. Again, the 16 inch MacBook Pro of, with its four Thunderbolt ports offers you immense flexibility. Not only the ability to connect to more external displays, have a dock on one side, have dedicated accessories on the other side, etc, etc. It's just far more usable that way. But then there is some who would still be attracted to the iPad Pro. And this honestly, uh, after the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro came out, my usage of the iPad Pro has also dropped significantly. Now I only use it when I'm maybe in the car and need to edit photos, but I need my stylus. I can't use my thumbs or my sausage-like fingers to do it. They're not sausage-like, they're nice fingers. But, so if you need touch input for the kind of work you do, if you've come to rely on touch input over the last few years, then the iPad Pro makes a lot more sense. In fact, even the iPad Air would do, by the way, guys, if you wanted to do that, you could use an iPad Air instead, as long as you have the Apple Pencil. And that in itself is a great option. The other really cool thing is that if you don't need the display size and if you don't need the ports and if you just need something that's super portable and uh, just gets the job done, it's a great option. Again, I've, been, I've used the iPad Pro for a few months as my, I forced myself in fact, to use the iPad Pro 30, uh, iPad Pro as my daily driver. And honestly, there wasn't much to complain about. Yeah, sure, file movement here and there, but you know, it's fine. The 13 inch MacBook Pro powered by the M1 processor is one impressive machine. And that's just looking at the base variant, mind you. It's got eight gigs of memory on board and just 256 gigs of storage. For any professional, the storage amount is far too little. 256 gigs is not even enough to handle one 4K project, as we very rudely learned. A terabyte of storage or at least 512 gigs is minimum required. Do yourself a favor, make that upgrade. This is a machine that will keep you happy for a very long time. There was a time within my own circle of content creators where when people ask me if they should buy a 13 inch MacBook Pro, this is the older Intel based versions, I would tell them no, simply because without a discrete GPU, a lot of applications like Premiere, in fact, the entire Adobe suite would not function very well. It was only the larger 15 and now the 16 inch variant that offered a discrete GPU. But if you wanted to buy this, it would cost you an arm and a leg. However, the M1 based MacBook Pro completely decimates that assumption. This has a very capable GPU, a very capable CPU, and no matter what task you throw at it, it executes it flawlessly and in record time. So there you go. That's our review of the 13 inch MacBook Pro powered by the M1 processor. If you guys have any questions regarding this, the MacBook Air, the iPad Pro, the 16 inch MacBook Pro, whatever, do leave them in the comment section below and I'll get back to them personally. Thank you guys for watching this video. Before you leave, make sure to hit the subscribe button on our channel. And of course, hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any amazing content from us in the future. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.